Hi. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul, and thanks for having me here today. Um, I am coming from a slightly different place than the last two speakers, but I think ultimately it's about the same issues, actually. And I'm an artist and a curator, and I believe passionately about the transformative potential of the arts and um, the power of storytelling. Um, I don't work in the art market. I work out of the gallery and the theatre um, scenario, and I work on the streets, on allotments, on bridges, in hospitals, on rooftops, in derelict buildings, and I work in a very participatory way so that the people who come to experience the work um, are active agents in the creation of that work alongside teams of people that might include anthropologists, doctors, economists, um, foragers, farmers, whoever seems to be appropriate to bring, bring together to um, make the project happen. I'm very um, passionate about public space, about bringing people together, about conversation. Um, I create projects this is a project called Feast on the Bridge, where we close one of the bridges over the River Thames, and 35,000 people come and sit down and eat together in a sort of reimagined re harvest um, supper in the heart of the city. And this is a participatory fruit salad toss with um, waste <laughs> food, fruit that was destined for landfill. Um, I also am interested in the cultural space of the museum, and I now am the director of this Empathy Museum project. But before that, I used to run a, a project called The Museum Of, which was about questioning um, what museums are all about and informing decisions about what happened to the future of a, of a particular building. But um, we invited people to make museums about themselves um, in response to big national museums being about a kind of national identity. I've got to go quite quickly. But 100,000 people made um, little museums about themselves. Um, so the work's kind of participatory, as I said. Um, it's also quite often about revealing something that's hidden. So this is part of a documentary I made for Channel 4 about um, the amount that the average British person consumes in a lifetime. And this is, I made 72 installations, and this is 15,000 pints of, 15,632 pints of milk that the average British person would um, consume in a lifetime. Um, so, I got approached by a guy called Roman Krishnarik, who's a writer and a philosopher, and he has written a book about empathy. And um, he asked me to work with him to create something experiential from some of the ideas that he is exploring in his book. And so I started looking at empathy and why empathy is important and why empathy is important, particularly now. Um, and the word empathy comes from a German word which uh, appeared in German philosophy and aesthetics in, at the end of the 19th century. And the word is Einfühlung. I might have said that wrong, I'm not very good at German. But it means feeling into, and it was about feeling into art and nature. And it's, it ceased to be so much about aesthetics, but I, I kind of quite like that, um, the idea that it's something active. And it's something about now um, moving in to take an imaginative leap to see the world through somebody else's eyes and to think about um, uh, viewing the world from, from another person's perspective. And I think in a kind of uh, post-Brexit Trump a uh, world with rising racism, xenophobia, all the problems that we um, are facing, uh, that it's empathy is a really powerful and important tool, not only in terms of um, global challenges, which I, I do think it's important for that, but also um, in personal transformation. So I think it's like an incredibly powerful tool in everything from understanding your own partner who's not seeing it like you're seeing it, to understanding the people who've moved in next door, to restorative justice, to um, issues around how we design things, how we um, create services for people, to uh, big conflict and world challenges. So, um, it's also important, I think, because we're facing a, an empathy deficit. That's Barack Obama calls it an empathy deficit. And levels globally in empathy are declining. And um, as a result of 
increasing isolation, people living on their own, um, a decline in public space, uh, a rise in free market economics. There's all sorts of reasons why this is happening. And we might think that we're more globally connected through things like internet, Facebook, social media, and so on. But actually, we tend to surround ourselves with people who are very, very similar to us and don't test our assumptions about our values or opinions. Um, there's a sort of a confirmation bias thing so that we actually, our, our work circles and our social circles and our online circles are very, very small and tiny. Um, so to respond to this, we took some of the ideas from Roman's book about what makes a highly empath empathic person. Um, I'll just run through them very quickly, but switching on your empathic brain is a kind of response to also uh, uh, neuroscientific development, which has shown that actually we're wired for empathy, and em empathy is something that we can learn. It's not, um, it's not just in us or not in us. We can learn it very much like riding a bike, and we need to practice it. Um, the second thing is about making an imaginative leap into seeing the world through somebody else's eyes, seeing something from someone else's point of view. Seeking experiential adventures, so not staying within your comfort zone, but making um, a leap out there into the world to uh, meet people that perhaps you wouldn't normally meet, have experiences that maybe you wouldn't normally have. Um, practicing the craft of conversation, and that's not about talking at people, that's also about listening to people, and we're incredibly bad at listening, and I'd quite like to do a project about just radical listening, actually, but that's... Um, and travel in your armchair, so that even if you're at home or you're unable to get out, um, you can travel into worlds through literature, through music, through film, through TV, documentaries, uh, that you can take um, th this leap into other people's uh, lives and worlds through that. And Roman talks about inspiring a revolution, so spreading empathy and the practice of empathy. Sorry. So, oh. Um, the Empathy Museum is imagined as an alternative high street. So it's a antidote to the idea of the universal panacea of shopping. And instead of coming out and having a consumption experience, you come out and you, you have a human experience. Um, so we've started with a shoe shop and a library, and eventually we will have a travel agent, a hairdresser, a cafe, and so on. Uh, we have three projects at the moment. We have a, a library project, a shoe shop, and we run a series of human libraries, where instead of borrowing a book, you borrow a person for a conversation. Um, but the first thing that we did was uh, create uh, a shoe shop, and I listened to a lot of people talking about what they thought empathy was, and most people either describe it as seeing the world through somebody else's eyes or walking in their shoes. And there's this old Native American proverb, never judge a man till you've walked a mile in his shoes. Oh, his moccasins. And so we built a giant shoe box inside an old shipping container, and um, we started off in Vauxhall in London, which is an incredibly um, changing area at the moment, and we collected stories from 30 people who lived or worked locally, and they're everybody from uh, uh, a gardener at the American Embassy to a drag queen to a divorce lawyer. They're people from all different walks of life. And we collected with a team of audio producers their shoes and their stories. And we call ourselves a museum because we house a collection, and the collection grows. So everywhere we go, we collect more stories and more shoes, and we travel internationally. And all you know about the person is their name and the size of their feet. And you come in, and you get fitted with the shoes that belong to a stranger. And they could be anybody. There's from a sewer worker to a sex worker to a refugee to a Vietnam vet to... Uh, surgeons, there's all sorts of different people in there. But they're quite often people with a story to tell, and they might be people that you might not um, come across in your everyday um, life. And then you go out and you take a walk in um, someone else's shoes whilst you're listening to them uh, telling you their story. 
And it's really powerful because you're on um, a journey on your own. You're on a physical journey. You're on an emotional journey. And there's something about wearing somebody else's shoes. You look down and they're not your feet. They don't look like your feet. And it's a bit like kind of putting on a mask or something like that. It feels very intimate and very powerful. And um, people have... Uh, amazing experiences doing it and then we have a kind of social space where you come back and you can have a conversation about the experience that you've just had but we've been traveling all over the place we've got about 120 stories now and we have a selection of them that we're showing in the cafe here so in any of the breaks or at lunchtime or after it's over please do come and we'll fit you with a pair of shoes and you can go out into the streets of Brighton and um, uh, walk in the shoes of a stranger and listen to their story um, that's a sewer worker and someone who's a professional roller derby girl. <laughs> and we've also got a model where we work on a particular area. So we worked with an organization called the Health Foundation, and we did um, a version of A Mile of my Sh In My Shoes where we just worked with stories from the NHS. So we worked across the UK and collected stories uh, from everyone from a prison psychologist to a hospital porter to um, a surgeon. And we um, then showed this work with the Health Foundation. Um, and most lately, a couple of weeks ago, in the Houses of Parliament. And the idea was that policymakers would um, walk in the shoes of those people who deliver the NHS. So that's a kind of another model and uh, perhaps a powerful way of people understanding what it might be like to be working in the same um, area. There's, you know, there's, there, but there were surgeons who worked, walked in the shoes of uh, uh, someone who's a receptionist in the GP who just went, I had no idea. And I think it kind of puts those people in connection with one another and it's quite transformational in terms of um, their experience and their understanding of, of how the other person is operating and living their life and working. Um, we ask people to leave behind something about what it feels like to have walked in the shoes and, and to feed back on the journey. And um, we are off to all over the world with it and doing various other versions um, around homelessness and around refugees. Um, so please do come and have a go. And um, thank you very much. <laughs>